declaration tonight. And we thank you for that truth that we can know and trust those words. Those aren't just random words or good sayings, God. It's your truth. It's who you are. Thank you that we are set free in you and the gift that it is to know you, that you welcome us in, that our identity is solidified in you and you alone. I pray for that truth to sink in tonight, that we'd open our hearts and open our minds to hear what you have to say to us tonight, that we would take it and that we would be open to wherever that is, Lord, that that truth would sink in for us tonight, that your love would wash over us and that you would fall for it. We thank you for who you are, and we declare your goodness here in this place and this night, and we pray this in you. Amen. Thank you so much, Megan. We get a little applause. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ladies, thank you so much for joining us. I just want to quickly introduce Angela Castle. She is one of the sweetest women and one of the biggest hearts of uh, just when you get to know her. I spent the day getting to know her. And one of the things she just kept saying was, wow, in, in how we are with our emotions and how we are in the way that we live as women, we have the opportunity to say, as her first book says, in our emotions, in the moments that we're in, we have the opportunity to come awake to everything that God has for us. And we have the opportunity to love one another and to love and show God's love. So, Angelie, why don't you come up here? She is an incredible author. I encourage you to get a copy of her book, especially her latest book, Awake. But she's from Southern California. She has a husband, Sam, and five kids. And she's so grateful to be here in Grand Rapids, where it is great. Yes. <laughs> so, no. Angelie Pass. Thank you. This is our. Oh, yes. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> is it so weird? Can I just stand here? All right. I'm just going to bring this down. So, I this is my first time to Michigan. And I got in really late last night. And so everything was dark. And then into my, I went into my hotel room, tried to go to sleep. And then I opened the blinds this morning and I gasped. Because I had no idea that uh, it was green here. I uh, I guess I just imagine from San Diego everything is really beautiful, that everything is kind of brown. And so I am so happy to be here. It's such a beautiful place. I am delighted, except for I, I met this wonderful woman last night on the airplane Mary she said don't come in February <laughs> so I won't be here in February come to San Diego you're all invited so I'm so happy to be here um let me open in just a little word of prayer okay Lord we um come from a lot of different places and not just physically but emotionally we come here carrying a lot we carry our work we carry our children we carry our loved ones we are actually carrying many things that you have not asked us to carry and in your word lord you ask one thing of us and that is to abide in your love and so god may we do that tonight may we abide in you may we rest in you May we find our comfort in you and you alone. Getting to that place of rest and abide. God, it's like taking off a really heavy backpack. Uh, with really large boulders. And it's hard for us to lay them down. But I pray that you would just help us. Help us. Give back to you what is yours so that we can receive from you what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, like I said, I'm from San Diego. Uh, prior to writing, what I did was I did wedding photography. 
And so I would kind of travel all over the place and do photography. And in this particular situation, I was invited to go down to Mexico, a little place called Cabo San Lucas. Has anyone ever been there? You ought to go. It's gorgeous. Um, but I was going to do the wedding photography, and my husband Sam was he's a pastor, so he was going to marry the couple. And on our way down there, um, I was pregnant with my fourth child, a little girl, and I was about 29 weeks pregnant. How many weeks ought you, what are you trying to get to, right? The magical number is 40, 40 right? And so I'm 29 weeks, I get on a plane, get down there, and um, as I land and arrive at the hotel, this gorgeous resort, I start to have contractions. You don't want that. That's not a good thing. And so I'm just trying to like kind of avoid it for a while, but inevitably they get stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, and then you need to go to the hospital. So I we pack this little bag. It's about midnight. We get to the lobby of the hotel. This hotel is one of those hotels that are just like everything is pristine and perfect and the pavers are in perfect order and there's these white and tan stones lining uh, the driveway and that leads up to the lobby and so we're waiting there the taxi come gets us and I remember leaning up against this pillar thinking I could like I could die or this baby could die um, and not knowing what this meant uh, I have C-section. So typically, if you're not aware, if you have one C-section, it's pretty common to have more. After having three, you certainly are having C-section. There's no other way around it. So uh, we're on our way to the, it's not even a hospital, it's kind of like a medic, like building. <laughs> you know, they probably like, you get, you get a rash, you go there, you know? And so they, you know, fuck me up to all the things and, um, in and without like really a translator, she's trying to speak English. I don't speak Spanish, you know, like all the hand motions. And she says, Okay, we're gonna have to deliver your baby. But I want you to know we have successfully delivered one baby here by C section. And I was like, Oh my gosh, she's trying to comfort me with this statistic. <laughs> and I'm like terrified. So we're praying and we're waiting, and our insurance is not. You know, they're like, oh, it's, they delivered a baby. You can have a baby there. And so they weren't going to pay for our plane, which was like, at that time, I think it was three three $300,000 to get a medic, uh, medic evacuation plane. And then you couldn't even get on a plane because I was having contractions. They won't let you on a plane. Anyway, so apparently Mexico has special drugs that we don't have in America. So I've got drugs and I was able by the grace of God to um, leave Mexico even though we knew we'd have a $300,000 bill. Um, as I came home, went on bed rest, um, my little girl was born at 38 weeks. And so there's this weird trauma that happens when everything turns out okay. Do you have a situation like that? Like something could have gone really, really badly a car accident or an illness or a mistake you made could have gone really bad but by the grace of god it, it's okay and so i carry this with me with just so much gratitude and peace but this is a story about a time in my life where i felt completely out of control completely unstable uh, by the life circumstances i was in and i imagine that as humans and yourself included you have been in a season of your life where you felt completely unstable. And part of that instability makes us really question life. It makes us, us question God. It makes us question ourselves. And it almost took me on this journey of who am I? Who am I? And you know my answer? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I know I'm good at a lot of things. I know I can do things. and um, But ultimately, I was growing very weary of that question. And I don't think we can answer this question apart from Scripture. Because the Bible tells us the truth about our 
our existence. And as you read through the scripture, then your life confirms it, right? Like the Bible tells us of depravity, and then our, our lives, we experience depravity. The Bible tells us the truth about pain, and you live long enough and you experience pain, and you know that's true. The Bible tells us about temptations and hope and, and um, redemption, and you live long enough, you realize, yeah, that's true. This is, this is, this, these stories actually uh, ring true of my modern day life, not just back then. And when we think about our, our lives unfolding there, there's a passage that's very familiar to us, I'm sure, that really walks us through many journeys and many stages of life. And this is Psalms 23, are you familiar with it? The Lord is my shepherd. And so we're kind of just going to walk through it together tonight, if that's okay. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Sometimes it's revisiting these passages and just remembering the way God is with us and the way God works in and through scripture to sharpen our own lives and remind us of things. So the Lord is my shepherd. Um, when you think about a shepherd, there's actually three roles of the shepherd. One is to protect want to give us belonging, and want to transfer us. So when you think about the Lord is my shepherd, think the Lord is my protector. Think the shepherd gives us a sense of belonging, right? We know uh, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. Jesus gives us a sense of belonging. And also a shepherd provides transport from one place to the next. I think about seasons in your life where you are in a transition, right? Right now we're going from summer to fall. And we think about all the changes with that. The starting school, the changing schools, the retirement, the people going back to work, vacations ending, new weather changes. Right? There's a lot of changes in this season in particular. And the shepherd takes us from one place to the next. Take a moment to consider how the Lord is your shepherd. And think about those seasons of transitions in your life right now. Thinking about uh, the beginning of new things and the end of another. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your families are shifting a little bit. Someone got married, someone passed away. Think about how the Lord is your shepherd. How has God protected you or gave you a sense of belonging or helped you move into the next season? And then I shall not want. I don't know about you, but I am someone who wants a lot of things. <laughs> I like, like, like stuff. I want more, more, more. more. Um, almost everything in my life. More ice cream, more entertainment, more joy, more peace. And here David is referring to this, I shall not want. And, and I want you to think about this. What are you seeking or chasing or needing beyond God? What is that thing, that person, that relationship, that if I just had this, then everything would be okay? Fill that blank. And Davis is saying, I shall not want anything else but my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. How does this happen? Um, I watched some really interesting YouTube videos about how this happens. Um, if you want a little entertainment, go Google that. How a shepherd lays down sheep. But there's two essential ways that this happens. One is if a sheep is really sick, what a shepherd has to do is really, it looks like a wrestling match. The shepherd comes behind it, has to bring in its legs, tucks the legs under, opens the mouth, the other one gives it medicine. So it's really this like, um, this hold, this tight hold to give the sheep what is needed for healing. The other way is a sheep must feel safe. So, so for in order for a sheep to lay down, even in green pastures, even where it's comfortable, even where it's good, 
the sheep has to feel safe. And there's no way a sheep can relax unless it knows there's no predators nearby. So consider this. Consider when you were almost forced to lay down. Maybe it was an illness or some form of suffering, but it was almost um, a hold to get you down. Recently, uh, my husband is a pastor, I mentioned, he went on sabbatical. And I remember uh, we had this conversation of like, uh, okay, so you're going on sabbatical, hun. So I'm going to have a whole list of things I need you to do while you're at home. Obviously, there's nothing, right? And he's, he was so kind and was like, I don't really want you to give me a list because I think this is a time not just for me to rest, but for you to rest, referring to myself. And I remember being like, I don't need rest. I'm good. Like, I'm actually, like, I launched a book. We're on a mission. We're like, things are going. We're, we're making progress. And it was like, oh, Lord in his kindness, wrestled me to the ground. Like, no, like, you need rest. And when you think about when was the last time you really rested, where in your soul you felt rest? He leads me beside still waters. If I go back just 30 seconds, though, and say, how many people in leadership, right, if God and Jesus as our shepherd, what a kind shepherd that says, you need rest. Most leaders say, work harder, right? When you're, most of the time, your bosses do more, accomplish more, do that, do that a little bit better. But what a kind, kind God we have that says do less, actually do less. And isn't it funny that we resist that? We kind of find that. Anyway, he leaves me beside still waters. Uh, okay, I love this. Uh, when you think about what you prefer, do you prefer lakes or oceans? So I'm about 20 minutes from an ocean. He referred to your guys' lake as the, the beach. Right? That was surprising. I, I thought it was just a lake, but that's a beach here, I guess. So think about still water. The thing about still water, which I prefer a lake actually, it's just so calming. But there's something about still water, and this is what it is it reflects us perfectly. When we look in still water, what we see is what ourselves, right? And here's the tricky thing about still water, though. Uh, Sometimes we don't like to see ourselves. Sometimes it's hard for us to like really even look in a mirror, right? It's like, oh man, whoa, I don't even want to see myself. And what the good shepherd does is lead us beside the waters to a place where we can truly see ourselves as we are and be seen by God as we truly are. Still water. For many of us, stillness is not peaceful. For many of us, in stillness, things get louder and more complicated and more confusing. But that is where our good shepherd leads us. He wants us to see ourselves clearly and for us to see him clearly. He restores my soul. I imagine that many of us have kind of fractured souls. And that, could, that fracture may have started a long, long, long time ago that no one has ever seen inside of you. Or it could be from today. And if we stop and we pay attention to our souls, our very beings, our very essence, what makes us us, separate from nature, separate from animals. Like we have this unique soul. Gosh, how needy are we for 
restoration in those very deep places. I love this, these words that represent restoration, reconstruct. This is what God does in our souls, right? Reconstruct, recovers, rebuilds, reestablish, refurbishes, rehabilitates, reinforces, renews, replaces, repair, rescues, revives. These are words for restore. This is what God does in our souls. This is what God is always seeking to do in our souls, in your soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, in John 10, 3, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his, uh, his own sheep by name and leads them out. The role of the shepherd is to lead his sheep. And not just in general, not just, hey, you, all of you, come on, let's go. It's a voice by name. He knows you by name. And you know, do you remember being a kid and when your your parents called you by name and you knew instantly you were in trouble? Like there's a tone in their voice where you're like, oh my gosh, I think I've got that out. Or like, what did I do? I didn't do it. You know, you're scanning like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Right. And think about um, times in your life, like, I would say this. As you know that tone of voice that your mother or father or caregiver had when they called you, the Lord has a way of speaking to you in a way where you know his voice. And some of you might be thinking, like, I've never heard God speak. Like, I don't know. That's maybe different. I want you to imagine um, your life. And this might take other, another time of reflection. But imagining when you know that you know that you know that you're what you ought to do. Even when it doesn't make logical sense. Even if everyone else is telling you you should do this. And yet, for some reason, in the core of your being, you knew you should take that job, break up with that person, move. You just knew. And I think we're all still becoming more and more familiar with the voice of God. And I think we know his voice for the future by recognizing the way he's spoken to you in the past. Right, some of us just love music. That was such a sweet time of worship. Some of us, God's really sweet to see in prayer worship. Some of us, it's things in nature, being on a hike, looking at the stars. And so I just invite you to consider paying attention to how God, his tone of voice with you. And if this tone of voice is anything like condemnation or shame, you know that's not the voice of God, because that is not how a shepherd is. There's conviction, but there's not condemnation. You look at the passage in um, Psalm 23, and in the first part, David is talking about all the things God has done and doing. And then he kind of makes this funky little shift where David starts talking about himself. And you see it here, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? You are with me. And consider a valley. Okay, I live in this, uh, I live in a valley. So where I live in this little town called Escondido, and it's called, it means valley. And so all around our town, you're going to see just these mountain ranges, okay? You guys have slopes here. A little different. Mountains, right? Um, it's inescapable when you're in a valley. And if you've ever, I've been like really into like, Sounds so weird, but like war movies recently, or like these Viking shows, and it's like the worst place to be in, in enemy territory is is the lower ground, 
the high ground is what everyone wants because you can see now you have access. And so this is the most vulnerable place is a valley. This is the most vulnerable place when you're under attack. Now when you think about the valleys in your life, maybe in the past or the present or things that you know are coming. God, there's just, it, it's impossible. It's impossible to know how to care for our aging family members. It's impossible to get out of debt. It's impossible, this relationship and this friendship. I've done everything I can. It feels impossible. Inescapable. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. I always, I, before studying this, I always thought of um, rod like a weapon that was used on me, right? I don't know, I don't know why I always thought that. Maybe um, that was always the way I interpreted rod. But the weapon isn't used on me. When a shepherd has the rod, it's kind of the shorter stick. It's not used on the sheep, it's used on the predator. It's used on the enemy. And then you have the long staff, right? Think of a big candy cane uh, with a curve at the top. And we you know what this is for. The shepherds use this for. They use it for rest and rescue and die. Rest. So what they would do is kind of like poke it in the ground and then lean on it. It helps them stand when they're too tired, when their legs are too tired. Christ is our staff. We lean on him. Also for rescue, right? There's that hook at the end. That hook goes around a sheep's neck for rescue, pulling them out of dangerous places, dangerous enemies or predators or cliffs. They use that to pull you back to safety. And then just when you think these are, things are about to get better, right? What could be worse than a valley? is enemy territory, right? You get through the valley, and now there's you're actually in enemy territory. In uh, verses five and six, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Notice there that David is not saying you rescued me from my enemies. David is still in enemy territory. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about the word enemy. I think um, none of us are really in actual physical battle right now. But we have many enemies in our minds, many enemies, many attacks that a lot of times we are just constantly protecting and guarding ourselves from attack. But I want you to consider um, that sometimes the enemy, right, is a person, place, or thing, but it's also um, a pain we carry. Right? Sometimes our greatest enemy is our deepest pain. I'm going to read this little passage out of um, Henry Nowell's book, The Inner Voice of Love. I think it's helpful to think about pain this way. What is your pain? It is the experience of not receiving what you needed most. It is the place of emptiness where you feel sharply the absence of the love you most desire. To go back to that place is hard because you are confronted there with your wounds as well as with your powerlessness to heal yourself. You are afraid of that place that you think of it as a place of death, enemy territory. Your instinct for survival makes you run away and go looking for something else that can give you the sense of at-homeness even though you know full well that it can't be found out in the world. How many of us, when there is an enemy, we are looking for every way to escape? 
We are strategizing. We are avoidant. We are obsessed with hurry because we're running away from enemy territory. We're running away from pain. And yeah, this is exactly where Jesus sets the table for us and says, come. You have to begin to trust that your experience of emptiness is not the final experience, that beyond it is a place where you are being loved. When I, uh, I have an opportunity, I still do, to write for what's called Encourage. It's an online blog really lovely group of women and they do this thing every year every other year where they all gather together and it's kind of a place to be encouraged ironically and this year the email came of where we're going and it was of all places Cabo San Lucas this place where never ever imagined going back. I never wanted to go there was this invitation to come. And so reluctantly I got my passport renewed and bought a ticket, got on a plane, and thought, okay, like I'll go have a good time. You know, that's fine. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cabo, it, there's a lot of resorts. It's a huge uh, tourist place. Long strips of beautiful white beaches, white sand beaches, right? So I'm in this, I land, and there's about three other encouraged riders that I meet at the airport, and we all get in a van that drives about an hour. And as we're driving and talking, all of a sudden I look up. And you know what I see? I see a resort that looks very familiar. One with white pavers and tan pillars. And I think to myself of all the resorts and all of the places in the world, this is where I'm going. And as I drive down this really steep driveway as I get there and start to approach, my body instantly starts to shake. I instantly start crying. And I'm kind of with people who don't know me. You know, this, we saw to wear masks at the time. And so it was very uncomfortable because I'm trying to, I don't know how to explain to these women what this place means for me. Uh, this, it's, it's, this for me is enemy territory. This is where a really scary thing happens. And we're standing in this lobby, right? This big lobby, and there's, I remember the chandeliers. It's so grand and it's so beautiful. And I'm just crying and crying. And these women are, I'm probably freaking them out, but they're totally so crying and sweet with me. And I'm trying to explain to them, like, what had happened when I was here, oh my gosh, seven years ago. And and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And we're supposed to meet the leader, we're supposed to come up to the lobby and meet us. And she's not coming. And we finally get a phone call and she says, Where are you guys? And we say, We're here, we're in the lobby. And she says, Oh, you are at the wrong hotel. And then I start crying more because in the presence of my enemies, my cup over. And what I mean by that is God met me in this place of pain with his goodness. And what does goodness look like is there's these three women who are standing around me. And one, one woman takes off her mask and takes off my mask. We're standing now kind of in the same exact spot where I was when I was going to have a baby and facing inevitable death of myself or this baby in a very traumatic way, she stands over me and she says, Angelie, do you know what's happening right now? And I said, I don't know. I don't, I think so. And she says, this is for, for all. You've probably never heard this word. It's a Greek word. But this is, um, this is what it means. Exactly. It means Jesus will will act like a hound 
to drive you in his love to the place of your enemies, to the place of your pain. He chases you in his love, not to hurt you, not to harm you, but to heal you and love you. She says, this is resolved happening right here. Of all the resorts we could have gone to, God has brought you here because he wants to love you in this place of great pain. And right there, he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And 10 minutes later, a car came and took me out of it. But I did not even know that I needed any more healing from that. Because for me, after I got home, baby was born, I was like, I'm done with that. I don't even want to think about it anymore. I'm over it. I don't want to think about it. I never need to go to Mexico. I don't want to, I like Mexican food, but I've never had to go there again. <laughs> but the Lord in his goodness and kindness will pursue you, will pursue us, will pursue the church, will pursue the lost in love to go back to that very place of pain to redeem you, to love you. Almost like the annoying waiter at the restaurant where you've barely taken a sip and they're refilling it already. It's like, leave me alone. Like, give me a second here. No, like, you know, uh, I love drinking tea of the saucer. And if the tea goes over into the saucer, it's like, oh, you know what? Like, that's wasted. You know, I missed it. Like, like your cup overflows. Like he wants to, it, for us, like that's wasteful. And for Jesus, it's like, no, more and more and more of my love for you. And we talked about this idea of safety, of coming back. Who am I? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? Why are you alive? And it's at this intersection of your pain and God's goodness that you discover your meaning. Here, let me read this for you. This is what I mean. God gives us all new names. Our new names identify our past and give us meaning to move forward. For example, if you have overcome addiction, your new name might be the one whom God set free. If you were abandoned physically or emotionally by a parent or a loved one, you are, your name means the one God remembers. If you spend your whole life unseen and God finds you, the one God pursues. If you survive a devastating divorce, the one God eagerly wants. If God made a way for you out of an impossible situation, the one God finds worthy. If God used your average abilities, looks, and limited education to help others, the one God adores. If God brought you out of darkness, the one God shines his light on. And for me, when I think about meaning, is my name. And I am the one God rescued. And from that place of meaning comes everything. Comes everything. That's where you stand. That's your anchor. Who Jesus calls you to be what he's called you out of. And it's at that intersection of your pain and his goodness. And if you think about your story, however, however long and short it is, you remember that moment when God met you in your greatest pain with his goodness. And I, I want to kind of wrap up the evening thinking about this, thinking you spending a moment to reflect on that, that place and your story and what your meaning is and how it's derived from that. Does that make sense? Thinking about your story and connection 
to God. There is, um, there's, you know, if you read John, God, this used to always bug me so much if you ever heard the gospel of John, in, you know, later, first, second, or John. But uh, John always would refer to himself as the one who God loved. And it, like, bugs me. Like, the audacity to be, like, God loves me. But I really, really actually think I thought about that so poorly. Because I think what John was doing is what we're doing here. Angela, the one God rescued. John, the one God loves. And as we carry that identity, who am I? This is who I am. I am the one God loves, rescued, adores, healed sees, knows, whatever it is for your individual story, when you know that, the result is freedom, is courage, it's peace, the fruit of the spirit, gentleness, self-control. So I'm going to end with that. Thank you so much for this, your kindness in coming. If you feel led, you can even sit down at one of these tables and write that out. Fold it up, put it in your purse, keep it with you, put it on your mirror at home. And remember, I am the one who I'm the fill of life. Lord God, thank you for this night. Thank you for these women. Thank you for this sacred moment where we get to remember our meaning in this life. Thank you for our stories and the way you weave your goodness and kindness in each one of them, and that you are our shepherd. May we know that more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. So help yourself. I'll be around if you want to chat or connect with me.